Was that was oh, that Fred Zar? Was that Fred Zar that you were working with? Fred Czar, yes, that was. That because in Fred Czar, I guess I, I expect that's Fred Czar. Yes, Fred Czar. Wow, yes, Fred Czar. Yeah, so you know, um, back in that time, you know, you're talking about I was 19, 20 years old. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I had all these sounds that I grew up with and these sounds that I was playing, and then this new movement that came in, this freestyle movement, and then all of a sudden I get this pop, you know, uh, artist. Yep. You know, type remix, and um, so you know. Um, it went from running to only in my dreams, uh, and then the, uh, another two records after that for her as well, and then um, Silent Morning. Oh, wow. Silent Morning came in. So, so Island Records reached out to me, and 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 uh, I believe through Jelly Bean, I guess I, I don't remember at the time, probably, and because he was kind of acting like my manager at that point, you know, um, they wanted me to remix the song. So I heard the song. I love the song. And I think Vito Bruno as well, because Vito Bruno managed uh, Noel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so he uh, he knew me from the club scene. Yeah. You know, and so so uh, I was hired to do this record. And um, when I got the record, it sounded like a demo, but it was good. It was like, it sounds good, but it's kind of demo, you know, it feels kind of demo-ish. I'm going to, you know, have to like work it a little. So at that time, I, was, I brought my... Um, I had an SB12. I brought it for the first drum machine at that time. And SB12, um, I made that beat, the beat for um, Silent Morning. And then um, there was this like little, this little line, but it was too close to um, uh, another record that was big called Love Letters on um, Cutting Records. You know, um, it was this little synth line. (laughs) <laughs> what I did was I'm not going to sing it because I'm going to sound funny singing it but what I did was I chopped the synth line and put a delay on it it's the first synth you hear in Silent Morning and Louis we lost you I think you got to hit the uh, computer again with the Wi-Fi hang on everyone Louis still there this story is getting really good I hope we didn't lose him hello Incredible story. Well, while while we wait for him to come back, let me share with you because he'll come back to us in a second. Um, Sal Carmona's New Year's Eve, the Banger Podcast. He's going to have on December thirty first, DJ Beloved, DJ Spen. Ian Friday, Jelly Bean Benitez, who Louis Vegas talking about, Jihad Muhammad, Ruben Toro, Stacey Kidd, a 14-hour nonstop event. Check it out. So hopefully we can get Louis back. He came back out. He'll come back in. He's probably resetting. Anyway, if you're just checking in, you're at True House Stories and we have Louis Vega. Uh, here he is. He's back. <laughs> Thankfully. Let's get him back in. Hang on, everybody. He's coming back. Of course, as it gets juicy, we get the Wi-Fi decides to decides to crash. Yep, let me get him in. Hang on, everybody. Stay with us. Ask him to start his video. You there? I'm here, Lou. Just turn your video. I think you gotta turn your video again. Hey, you sound kind of like and here's robot. the thing and I told everybody of course as it gets juicy we lose Wi-Fi <laughs> it's not um let me see let me see if it says S to I'm on ah there you are okay you there yes we're here I'm here so you were saying listen if I'm la- if I'm lagging too long and it sounds no we love it no Louis, we, oh. Papa, we love it are you kidding this is getting hot now we're like Yo, yeah, we yeah. want to know the inside. This is people like screaming. They're writing hearts to you and stuff behind us. Oh, that's sweet, man. Jelly Bean. So you're now saying Jelly Bean's kind of managing you. Noel, SP 1200. Take us there. Yeah, so I'm making a record. And um, like I said, I I, uh, I uh, made a new beat to it. I had this SP 1200. I, then I had um, 
like I, I created a hook out of something that, you know, he, he, the producer, when he grabbed the, this little hook, this, this little synth line, it was reminiscent of a big record that was already out. And I said, you know what, we can't use that. It's going to, it's, it, that's from another record. I said, let me chop it. I just chopped it and put a delay on it. And when you hear Silent Morning, that first little synth sound, I made that out of that line. Really? Yeah. That, dun, 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 you know, that little thing. Yeah. So, so that's a it synth. became like a hook. Yeah. And, it's a synth line, but but it's a it, but it, the synth line was kind of like a bite from another record, and I didn't I didn't want to put that on the record. I think it, it would ruin it. You know what I'm saying? It was a popular record that was out at the time uh, called Love Letters. You know, so I took the first two notes and put a delay on it, but it created a hook. I said, man, that sounds hooky. It's so simple, but it sounds hooky. And then um, at that time, you know, the, you know. A lot of us were working together, doing stuff here and there. And um, I had asked David Cole to uh, play keyboards on it. Oh, and wow. we did the whole emulated part with the vocal, that's David Cole uh, playing that, that that part, which is uh, amazing. It, it came out so great. So the record, you know, these records, I'm t- they were on the radio. Um, you know, I mean, you know, that Only In My Dreams record sold over a million copies, easy. You know, uh, Silent Morning, 250,000 copies. I know. These were pop records. They didn't just... Yeah, pop man. Pop it records, was, bro. You were nailing pop music now. But but Silent Morning was... It, it had its underground feel before it became like that in, in, in the freestyle world. Let's say. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, uh, Only My Dreams was definitely straight ahead, straight on pop. But I remember 1018, the Ron Ricardo killing that record. Like, Roman was yes. rocking that thing. Ron Ricardo, wherever you are... God, ah, yeah. there he'd be playing that record to death in Silent Morning. So, That's my and the Animal, yeah. and the, uh, Jose Animal Diaz, yes. Yeah, we were all DJing at the same time, you know, because uh, 85, when um, I only played in the Devil's Nest for like nine, ten months. It was a short time, but it felt long, and it was, a lot happened in those ten months, you know, um, because from there, I got my first job in New York City, 86. That's what everybody wants to know. Where did that start? You know, 86, um, you know, um, they were they were opening up the fun house again because it had closed down. That's where Jelly Bean played. Big club holds like 3000 people. Amazing spot, you know, but it closed down. And the owner of Better Days, which is another club where one of my mentors, Bruce Forrest, played at. And, and, and David Morales played there. Kenny Carpenter, T. Scott. I mean, you know, come on. It was amazing in that club. You know, the music that came out of that club and the DJs you know, the crowd, you know, so, um, same owner of that club, he bought, he bought the old fun house and it was, uh, they were calling it heartthrob. So I went down, you know, and I met the manager of the club, uh, John Ferry, may he rest in peace. You know, he, uh, he, um, he asked me to audition for him and I went, and, and, and the cool thing is that I went to the club with jelly bean. So how much better can you have it? Yeah, right. That's yeah. Yeah, wait, how's that work? I went to go audition and I brought the guy who who was a big part of that club when it was the fun house back in the days. I went, I, I, I brought the king down and shit. So, you know, um, I went into the club and he says, you know, do you know, can you mix in front of me and stuff? And and he had three turntables. He had three and I had a Yuri mixer. It was three 1200s. And man, I did like a three turntable mix and I was just like doing my thing. And he says, man, I want you to start real soon. I was like, what? You know, so from there, that's when I went back to Sal and, 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 you know, Sal, you know, he gave me his blessing. It was wonderful. Sal Abatello. He says, look, Louis, man, this is your chance. Go do it. Go do it. Yeah, Manhattan's big, bro. Manhattan's yeah, big. Green, you were in New York city. That's it, man. And yeah, especially in a club that size with a great sound system and having that history, that club, you know? So <clears throat> the first thing that happened is when I went down there, the crowd, you know, came down but then it became all the boroughs coming into the city you know um and when i was at heartthrob man it just you're talking about a year and 10 months of man great music that came out of that and bliss know? for you bro you were the hottest thing out in that scene at and that time. it was a lot of kids coming out you're talking about 2500 to 3000 kids coming out each night you know what I'm saying you had friday you had saturday i was there two nights a week you know, and I did that for about a year and 10 months. And, and uh, all those freestyle records that we started making, because then I started producing, you know, I did about 100 records in, in that in that uh, type of style of music. You know, um, uh, 
as we were making the records, we were playing them for these for everybody. You know, Latin Rascals would bring me stuff. Um, Carlos Berrios, I mean, you know, Mick Mac, like everybody, you know. And at the same time, the house records were out. You know what I'm saying? Because house right. music would just come out, and I was playing house music as well. You know, I just wasn't known for it, but I was playing a lot of it from the Bronx down all the way to now. You know, so um, you know, I I was also playing Mr. Fingers. Uh, I was playing Marshall Jefferson, Virgo. You know, all and you know, uh, DJ International tracks. You know, imagine it on that enormous sound system. And imagine, tell them how many hours you were working. Oh man, you were. See, they don't, you didn't mention that yet. Is that two hours set? Please explain the night to people what a real DJ meant in New York. Play. Well, you know, I'm just saying that the DJs in New York, you had to play at least uh, seven to eight hours and some went even longer. Right. Um, if you were at places like, you know, Zanzibar or, or the garage and you hung out there, those were like 12 hour clubs. Easy, you know. Um, but uh, I was open. We were open till from 10 to like five or something like, something like that. Uh, so seven hours, let's say. And then from there, I will go with my entourage, like a group of 30 people. We go to the garage. You took right. 86 at that time, 85, 86, you know. Um, so, um, you know, it was it was really a, a, a great time for for that music and um, for all kinds of music, because in New York, it was about it wasn't about one kind of music. That's the great thing that I loved about that era. And even into the early 90s, it was uh very early 90s it was it was about good music you know what i'm saying and um and remember in my night i played from latin hip-hop freestyle house music reggae hip-hop uh dor new wave music you know all those different styles and disco right you know, you know r&b soul all that was happening in a night so we kind of learned how to play different styles of music but giving it a flow you know what I'm saying? It's not just throwing things on because you be that crowd wasn't having you. They, if you ain't doing it right, they walking off that floor. Tell them that. See, that's why I try to explain to people. They don't understand that. It's yeah. not pre-programmed. This is, you need to perform and perform you well. Right. You had to do it right. And if you didn't do it right, they would let you know. They would yell right. you out. They'd say you're tired. Yeah. Scream yeah. your yeah. name. You see that dance floor scatter. You know what I'm saying? You don't want that. Like know, Moses. So, Moses. On the water. Moses. But, you know, we learned from, I mean, I learned, I got to say, from watching DJs like uh, Bruce Forrest, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Humphreys, and and Zanzibar. Bruce Forrest was at Better Days. I used to go to the garage and hear that in the band. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I used to hear DJ Raul at Bro 96. I used to hear Danny Privet at Laces. Come on, I could go on and on. Uh, Kenny Carpenter. And each one had had their own style. So you would go there and listen and watch the crowd. And it would, it couldn't help but to, grab something from it you couldn't help it you yeah, couldn't help sure, it, man. it would, that was school right there you that know? was all school it was, it was really school and um i learned a lot from a lot of those djs i could i could tell you a long list of them because remember what i said i was going out you know i'm, I'm roller skating you know four five days a week i'm also going to clubs on weekends you know what i'm saying so you know i i got the i got to hear the best out here in new york you know so, you know, how are you not going to learn anything from that? That's right. Exactly definitely, right. Definitely did. You know, so, and listen, um, you taught us a lot, too, because I know when you were out playing, too, you can't help when you're hanging out with other friends and you're listening. You're like, oh, I like what he just did with that. Just yeah. natural. It's natural. You, you, you know how many people you've touched and taught? You don't even realize. You're just doing what you do naturally, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Well, well, you know, from... I think to me, it's like, you know, the, the first, the, the hardest thing is, the thing that takes time, I mean, is, uh, you know, finding your own identity, finding your thing. What is your thing? What is, you know, what, what do you have that's different? You know, because there's DJs are a dime a dozen now, you know. Um, and a long time ago, you know, when I was playing in, in these places, I found my thing. But I also wanted to progress, you know, I wanted to, you know, okay, so what am I doing after this, you know, and I felt like after I had made about, like I said before, you know, uh, close to 100 of, you know, freestyle from records. the freestyle movement, you know, as a remixer, as a as a producer, because I started producing at 86 is when I produced my first record. Um, at that time, when I was a heartthrob, and I was uh, dancing on the fire for India, right? You know, 
And um, and then from there, I started, you know, producing a bunch of other records and stuff. But, you know, when when I did uh, all all the freestyle and Latin hip hop records, I felt like I wanted, you know, I went as far as I could with it, you know, I, you know, and I said, you know what, I, you know, I want to try house music, man. I love house music. And I feel that as a producer, I could bring something different to it. You know, I could I could I could bring my thing to it. So what's so, the first record? What's that first record that that introduces everyone to Louis Vega and the house sound? Man, um, the first record that introduced Louis Vega and the house sound, I would probably say is uh, "Take Me Away" by uh, Two in a Room. Okay, I produced that one, and um, I produced another one called um, "Feel the Magic." Right. Feel the magic. Those are the early, early. I mean, you know, those sound for me now is like, oh my god, you know, whatever. But but was was, that was you breaking out of that Latin freestyle sound into this house sound, right? But don't forget, uh, I mean, but a- a- actually, when I was at Heartthrob from eighty six to eighty eight, around uh, I believe e- even eighty six at that time, maybe close to eighty seven, I got a visit from Todd Terry you know, uh, in the club. And, uh, he came, he got him, he, he got into the booth cause the, it was hard to get in that booth. You know, you had to, you'd go through like a, like a green room kind of, and then crawl in this square hole, <laughs> yeah. in the booth. you know? So, but he got in the booth, he was there and someone had brought him in and, um, he brought me some music on, on, uh, on cassette and it was like party people. It was, you know, you know, his early records. And I said, yo, this record is hot but I don't play cassettes. I need you to make a reel to reel for me. And then I can play it off this reel to reel that's right here with a pitch control. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Cause I want to mix it. I want to make it sound good for you out there. So he came the following week and he brought me party people. And, and, and from there on, he, you know, I got Bango, uh, you know, Black Right, A Day in the Life, you know, all right. those records. And I was playing those records months before they were out to all these kids out there in New York City. Mind you, they were probably playing them in Brooklyn and other places, but this was in the city with a large amount of people. And I think he brought it to Roman Ricardo as well. Yeah, Roman, so, was, Roman was rocking that stuff too at that time. So we were both playing them very early. And um, the crowd went mad. This was a new sound. It was different. It was like, wow, listen to this sound. It's so powerful. You know, uh, you know. Uh, it was interesting how Todd, he, he sampled a lot of music from the electro music as well from the disco, some of the disco jams, you know, like the, and, and the break beats, just the, it was so clever the way he did it. And, um, well, well, the music just took the dance floor by storm, man. It's just like, it changed everything. You know, we were already playing house music. We were already playing the freestyle music and all the other styles, but this, what Todd did right here, it took it to a, another level. It was a, it was a tougher sound. It was funky. Um, <clears throat> it was funky, but it had, it was full of hooks. You know what I'm saying? It was full of hooks. And um, as I was playing those records, you know, uh, Todd and I became close. You know, I started hanging out in Brooklyn with him. He lived by Coney Island somewhere. And he used to come up to the Bronx where I lived at. And um, we just used to talk music and, and hang out. It was wonderful. And then, um, and then, He's like, Louie, man, you know, I'm, I'm making so many records right now. I'm going crazy. I said, he said, why don't you, you know, uh, I like the way you mix records. Why don't you mix some of my records? I said, sure. You know, what do you want me to do? <clears throat> so and that's when you see like a, a, a lot of, um, you see my name on a lot of Todd Terry's records at that time in the late 80s. Right. Uh, records like Sax, uh, 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 Give Yourself to Me is called, um, you see DM, DM, DMS. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the beat goes on, uh, Black Riot, uh, just make that move. You know, I did I did a bunch of records for Todd at the time, and and um, we were hanging out at D and D Studios because that's where I was doing them, D and D Studios. You know, but don't forget at the same time, you know, this is all happening. You had the hip hop world blowing up big time. Oh yeah, around you, all around you. Yeah, right. yeah. So you you know you talking about when we're in D and D Studios, you know. We would see DJ Premier. Um, I mean, you know, we were, uh, and, and then later on in the early '90s, seeing Tribe Called Quest at uh, at Jive Studios, Battery Studios, right? 
You know what I'm saying? So all this is happening at the same time because don't forget, I was playing hip hop too. I was playing Bismarcky, all the Molly Mall stuff. I was, I was, you know, uh, Eric B. Rakim, was, you know. was this at the time you were at Roseland when you were well, this is when I was from Heartthrob all the way up? I was playing those Roseland. I know because you did you know? Roseland too. You were doing. Yeah, yeah, Roseland was later. I would do guest spots at Roseland. I was never a regular. Oh, I thought for whatever reason you were. Okay, I'm sorry. My mistake. no, it was um, it was a uh, heartthrob from '86 to '88, and then it was Studio Fifty Four. Right, I remember and that. There, it was some Roseland guest spots, and 1018. I always did guest spots too on the holidays. Right, because Ricardo was do all the you know the, the, the Saturday night. Yep. Yeah, yeah, with Vito Bruno. Yes. Yeah. But we were all friends, man. We would all hang out. I would go to support him at, at uh, 1018 when I was off, you know, uh, not working or whatever. You know, we would see each other. He would come see me. You know, we, uh, I knew Vito, the whole crew. I mean, everybody kind of knew, you know, supported each other and, and went out to each other's shows and stuff. Of course, everybody has their competitive sides and everything. Now, that was another thing I was going to mention. It you kept friendly friendly. competition. You know what I'm right. saying? It was, it was loving. It was a, I call it loving competition because you didn't want to hurt anybody. It was like we're all in a race. Trying to stay in the top. That's all it is. Everybody's racing, but they all want they want to help each other, right? Yeah, yeah. It was always like that. You know, um, there was never no animosity. So at, at this time, that for sure. Were you ever dreaming that you'd be traveling yet at all? Or ever thinking about it? Just playing in New York, right? But you know, the crazy thing is that the first time I traveled, it was uh, '86, and it was. Um, Thank you to uh, an early club I used to go to uh, in the early 80s was called Danceteria. That was, uh, you know, come on. Um, Mark Caymans. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Freddie Mark Bastone. Oh, man. Freddie Bastone, Mark Caymans. Yep. So it was Mark Caymans who came to me at Heartthrob one night. And he says, Louis, man, have you ever left New York City to play anywhere else? I said, no. And he goes, um, how would you like to travel to Tokyo? I said, Tokyo. I said, I don't even have a passport. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I've just been from the Bronx to Manhattan and that's it. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like, and the boroughs, you know what I'm saying? But um, I said, wow, that sounds amazing. He, I said, what do I have to do? He says, well, you know, it's it's a club in Tokyo. You would play for, uh, for I believe, eight to 10 nights. But it was crazy. It was, you're playing in the same club every night and every night was a different crowd. You know, so it was this club called Turia in uh, Tokyo. And, um, you know, he was, I guess, the the, the talent booker for the DJs. Who, right. Um, of course, he went out there and played a bunch of times already. But when I, um, that's when I went to play out there. It was, you know, I was even a little nervous about it because, um, you know, I got to say, you know, I was brought up uh, by my grandmother, by the way. Um, my mother and father split when, when I was seven. So I was with them till I was like six, five or six. And then I went to my grandma's house, you know. But um, my mom always lived one block away. So it was like right there, you know, but she was working heavy. So it was, I had to stay with my grandma. But my grandmother was the one that pushed me to go. And she says, you know, you should really go to Japan and, and do this. I think it's good for you. You know, this is very important for you. And um, so I did it based on her, you know. Recommendation and push, right? And pushing me to do it. You know, I go, did it. Go, go, go. Yeah, I went out there, but I'll never forget, you know, um, I met some wonderful people out there and they took me to Mount Fuji when I was out there. And when I went to the mountain, you know, we were driving up there, you know, um, all of a sudden, um, you know, you, uh, I believe it was in the hotel. If I called the hotel or something, there was an emergency call and it was my grandmother. She passed away. Oh, oh my yeah. God. But she told me to go. So, you know, for me, I felt that was just a big message, you know, coming coming from a very spiritual person. My grandmother, she was like a nun. She was a saint. You know what I'm saying? She, she took care of, a, of a, over, I, I think, over 70 or 80 foster kids. Oh, wow. Wonderful so lady. Was, yeah. yeah. So um, she, you know, that was, you know, she really uh, did beautiful things. So, um. You know, I went to this uh, club, and I'll never forget, uh, I met the group Climax. They were performing at the same time. They were I was DJing, and they were the performers. So they would do the show, their whole show, and then I would go on afterwards. You know, it was a, 
whole nine to ten days of that. And they were amazing. I loved them. They were so nice. You know, I'll never forget that. You know, but that was my first time that I went out in 86. And then the second time was when I went to the UK in 89. But by that time, uh, I had already done all those records uh, for Todd Terry and did my first few house records. Right, right. And um, I had a manager at the time. He managed um, Gangstar. And his name is Patrick Moxie. Oh, manager. yeah. Ultra, Ultra. Ultra Records, yes. Ultra. He was my manager at that time. And um, he says he's he's the one that brought me out to the UK for the first time. And I played at Sunrise. I played at, um, oh, goodness, what's the other one's name? And there were so many great, it was the first two, uh, the early, the early, uh, I guess. Well, I, remember, I remember we had Norman Jay on. He mentioned that he was one of the first to have you. As well, exactly. But I was going to get to that too. So that's I played, those, yeah, I played those two big, right? I played those two big raves, and I played clubs, and and the clubs that he booked me was High on Hope, and it was Norman Jay who first had me over there. It was man, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, look at all these people going crazy, you know? And um, you know, it was they were loving soul music, you know, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, you know, you know, uh, it was predominantly white, and I was like. Man, these people got soul. I never seen that in my life. Right. The same thing I said when I went over there. That's the same thing like I said. I freaked out. I was like, wow. You know, because, you know, we're brought up in the Bronx. It's, well, for us, as you know, Latinos, African-Americans, we're the ones that, you know. Or you went to, know, like, clubs in Manhattan. was either black. It was, was a, a gay crowd. You know, saying, this, this is my music back in, in New York. And then you go to London and you see all this. And you're like, wow, what is going on here? They are loving this. This is amazing. So um, anyway, I played at um, Sunrise and Energy. Those are the two uh, big raves that I played. And um, it was amazing. I mean, this the same place that I played, the same booth that I played in, you know, in 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 those in those uh, raves. Carl Cox was there, Paul Oakenfold, Paul Trouble Anderson, um, Bobby and Steve. I mean, everybody and playing house music. You know what I'm saying? They was playing house music. You know, um, either Chicago house music, Detroit techno music, or New York dance music. Right. You had all that being played out there. And it was, wow, mind-blowing. You know, as well as the music that came, because it was house music, a lot of house music that came from the UK that was amazing, too. Like Oh, at that know, time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, all yeah. The, all those records, you know what I'm saying? It's like, come on. You know, um, Richie Rich, all that, you know. Um, Buddha Ray, all that stuff coming yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, when, when, when I went to England, everything just went to a whole different level. It was like, wow. And when I came back, I came back so amped. But the craziness, crazy thing is that when I came back, I was offered an album deal by Atlantic Records. And Joy Carvello called me and he says, Louis, I want you to make an album. You know, um, I said, me, you know, me like a DJ, make, I'm, I just want you to make an album, whatever you, whatever you're feeling, make an album. Wow. You know, so it's crazy. You know, you're this young kid, you know, it's like, okay, it's like, here's boom. Here's the check. Go in there and start making a record. You know what I'm saying? It's like, wow. So I booked um, Battery Studios because at that time I was already working in studios. I worked at Sigma. I worked at, you know, all the different studios in New York City. Um, and um, when I went to uh, work at um, Battery Studios, uh, that's when I started making this record. And and um, the first thing I did was reach out to two young singers that, you know, they used to go to Heartthrob all the time. They used to go to the Devil's Nest and all that. And it was uh, Mark Anthony in India. So, you know, it was like, uh, you know, at, at that time, Mark Anthony, you know, he was our best singer and, and India was our best singer. It was like, okay, well, India ended up writing a lot of the album, just about all of it, unless we did a couple of remakes and, and, um, and singing backgrounds. And, um, right. Mark Anthony sang the lead and, you know, and at the same time, I'm trying to follow the footsteps of, of my uncle. My uncle was a famous salsa singer, Hector Lavo. Um, yes. Close that too, brother. Hector Lavo, find your records. And he did a lot of records with Willie Colon, tons of records. Willie Colon produced them till the end. And um, I said, man, I, you know, maybe we could do something like a Willie Colon and, and Hector Lavo of dance music. That was the idea. But um, this album just uh, turned into like a mixture of 
what I had been doing all that time, which was anything from a house record to maybe a freestyle thing to uh, to a slow jam, I mean, to pop, you know what I'm saying? We mixed it all up. And um, one of the first singles that was uh, written by India and uh, Derek Whitaker, may he rest in peace, is uh, Right on the Rhythm, you know? When I was working on this record, you know, um, I was still playing in the clubs and and um, it was like 89, 90, somewhere around there. And uh, I like this record called A Touch of Salsa. And it was produced by a guy named Kenny Gonzalez, right? And um, Todd, and I saw it was from Brooklyn. I said, Todd, you know, you know, th this record, and it's called Touch of Salsa. Do you, do you, I really like it a lot, man. It samples Celia Cruz and Sylvester at the same time. But it's, it makes sense and it sounds awesome. So he said, yeah, that's Kenny Dope, man. Kenny Dope Gonzalez, he works at a record store called the Record Center in Brooklyn, in uh, I believe Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And I was like, what? I was introduced me to him. So uh, he introduced me to Kenny. And, um, you know, we uh, just started chatting about, I said, you know, I love the record. I want to remix it. And it's crazy because I never got a chance to remix that record. But we just got so into talking to each other and what, we, you know, what I, I was listening to his beat records. I was already playing them. Some of the records that he was making on new groups, some of his tracks. You know that Happy Rose thing, the conga that he, everybody was playing, the conga track, the, the one with the yeah. Happy oh, that, Rose. That's yeah. after, that came happy after. Song. I mean, before that, he had House Syndicate, uh, you know, right. like all the records that he was doing on New Groove, right? Right. So he had a label with New Groove, Dope Wax, right, I believe? Dope Wax, yes. And, um... Kenny was like, you know, uh, you know, we started, you know, I started hanging out in his little studio at home. He came to mine. I didn't have a studio. I just had like a keyboard and an FP 1200 at that time. See, everybody so, was thinking now at this point, bro, that you had this like lab. No, exactly. not yet. Not yet. Like, Yo, he's going home. He's working in this, this gorgeous lab. No. no. Don't you have and, a keyboard, a sampler? Listen, I was writing the stuff on the Korg M1 and I had an SB 1200. That's all I had. And what Kenny had bro, what are you thinking? Like, like got two inch machines. What are they thinking? Like, you got this like crazy stuff. No, not pictures. yet. Not yet. No, because we're seeing pictures. Don't forget now. You know, IDR, uh, RPBC's got a picture with you in the studio. We're saying, yo, he's Mac Daddy now. Look at him. Oh, uh, no, Mac Daddy. That was the studios <laughs> that we rented. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. We rented, you know, they were. Oh, well, you studios. created a dream for all of us. That was awesome. Oh, hey, man. Papa, you did good. Nobody hey. asked me, though. Nobody asked me. No, because oh, we man. assume. That's the problem. You know what it is? We're reading the magazines around the world. People are reading it, and they're seeing the picture of you, like, you know, with hands on the console. Yo, he's doing Debbie Gibson. He's got number one yeah. record. Everybody's thinking, you know. And here we are, M1, SB12. Okay. Thank you. SB1200. You know, and an M1. I upgraded that SB12. I got, I, I sold it, and then I got the SB1200. And um, Kenny had, um, I believe he had a was a 16 track board. Was it a Tascam? I mean, he could tell you everything, but but he had the Akai 950. He had just a couple of pieces. I'm talking about we just had a couple of pieces. That's all we had. Okay. You know? So. Um, we were listening to music. Kenny was showing me some of the beats he was making, some of the stuff he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, showing him the stuff for the album and the songs. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm doing this album and I'm in the studio for like six months. I said, why don't you come in and uh, just, you know, maybe drop some beats on some of the, you know, some of the songs. If you hear something, come in, see if you hear something. When he came in and he was dropping beats and stuff, it was like, wow, this is turning into something because between the kind of grooves that I had and the beats that he had it was feeling like something different and I said you know what let's try something without these songs let's do something just me playing some grooves over some beats that you make so um he was he made some beats and I would play a bass line then I would play some chords to it stuff so, because remember by that time I already took the lessons but Oscar Hernandez and, right you, you you're, you're proficient was, yeah you're going I was hot playing in two keys <laughs> If you listen to a lot of my songs, they're in two different keys. You know what I'm saying? That I can play. I could, I could at that time I could play decently in. So, yeah, but they were good chords. Did I remember the good minor yeah. chords? They were perfect. I like them. Well, that was from the uh, the, the Oscar Hernandez lessons, man. Which was okay. Great. So, so it was early. So I would uh, we were just doing music like that, and we said, "Man, this sounds really good." And we, we you know, 
you know, he got, we got through the whole album, we did our thing. And then I started getting more remixes. Like, you know, Debbie Gibson came back again. She wanted a remix on something new. There was a song called One Step Ahead. And then uh, you know, it was Joey Carvello calling me again, you know, who- Louie, Louie, I need you to mix this thing, Louie, come on! Yeah, exactly. Like, Joey. The album was like, Louie- Hey, he would call you kid. You say, kid, I need you to do this for me, kid, yeah. come on! Yeah. <laughs> Joey Carvello, oh God. Like, hey, Debbie's back, man. We, we got this record right here, man. We, and then I said to myself, man, this, we, well, Kenny and I, we were talking, we were like, this style that we have right here, this, this cool groove, we did a record called Ride. If you look at uh, Ride on a Rhythm, it's one of the dubs it's called Ride. Yes. And I think that's one of the early ones where Kenny and I alone, because the early one before the Chrissy Ice was with Todd, was with Todd Terry, too. It was a three of us. But when me and Kenny alone, alone, it was Ride, a record called Ride. And um, those grooves right there, I said, man, this is like, this feels good, man. But you know, we got to figure out a way to get that people know about this, because we started noticing like Tony Humphreys uh, playing right on the rhythm. You know, it started, you know, word started getting around. And then um, Merlin Bob and Timmy Regisford, they're yeah. all rocking your sounds. We're hearing it. And we're all, and me, everybody's playing your stuff. Everybody. So this record ride was one of the key records that, you know, said, okay, well, Louis on keyboards, Kenny on drums. Let's, you know, let's groove. And then, we got a pop remix. I'm like, what are we going to do with this pop remix? And then Kenny and I would say, okay, we could do something with the song you know, to complement the song. And so we thought about it. And we said, why don't we take the B-sides and just do something totally that has nothing to do with the song. Maybe find a little hook from the song, from the singer. So at least right. you have a little bit of her in there, a little bit of the, the artist in there, you know, with a hook or something. And then uh, create these grooves that we're doing, you know? And then that's when we did One Step Ahead, the Masters at Work dub. And, yes. And actually, Masters at Work, you know, was a crew name that Kenny had for years. You know, you know, it's, it's when, when we came up with this, this, this whole vibe and this sound, you know, uh, I said to Kenny, we need, a, we need a name. We need a name for us together and not just like a separate name. It should be something together. And he goes, well, I got this, you know, this crew name that I use called Masses at Work. I loaned it to Todd Terry, but I could take it back. <laughs> That's what he said. That's what I was going to ask you. To, yeah, because I always thought Todd had the name as well. He, no, that was Kenny's, Kenny's crew name. And he loaned it to Todd because Todd was always looking for names. You know what I'm saying? To, 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 <laughs> to, he has so many different projects that he wanted a name for, for, for his projects. And I guess Kenny loaned him Masses at Work. And, and I think one of the guys from Masses at, from Ma Kenny's crew, Masses at Work, was down with Ty with the record. I mean, Kenny can elaborate on that, but um, I know that. Um, but when you say when you say crew, is it a, like a breakdancing crew? No, or? like DJ crew. Kenny had DJ crew. Okay. yeah, he would do parties. He was already doing parties, doing his thing, you know, at, at the same time in Brooklyn. And um, you know, so so I said, man, masses at work. I said, I love that name. It sounds perfect. You know, um, and then I thought about it. I'm like, damn, we calling ourselves masses at work. That's kind of like, we better be good. <laughs> we better be good. For yeah, it's already coming in. You're already coming in at a high level. You're saying you're a master now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe we didn't even like, I didn't even like deeply get into that like that. Like thinking like when, when we weren't thinking in an egotistical way, we were thinking of like masses at work is cool. It's a cool name. You know what I'm saying? And we were just like, let's, let's use that name. And then, um, Kenny's like, yeah, let's use it. So then that's when we did the Masters at Work dub on um, Ride on a Rhythm. At the same time, you know, some of the labels started sniffing around and you had cutting records and then they wanted to sign Masters at Work. So they said, we want to do an album. And it's like, oh, goodness. Okay. Remember, I was on Atlantic already with this album. So, okay. So now Masters at Work, we can, you know, do a Masters at Work album without signing ourselves to any label and locking us down. So, um, when we signed a mess, we signed to Cutting Records, we were like, okay, well, we need to do, you know, we got to give him like 10, 12 tracks, damn. So Kenny has some tracks that he already had, you know, and um, when when I just went in with him and arranged some of them, you know, some of the tracks and then other ones that, you know, we did it, some more that we played together and did the thing with the, you know, keyboards and, and drums. I, I, I have to go through the songs to know, but, uh, you know, at that time I'm playing at Roseland and, and, you know, I'm playing hip hop, I'm playing house. It was heavy, you know, it was amazing. You know, 
crazy a uh, couple of thousand. I was going to say that you have about 3,000 people in that place. Yeah, so so um, Kenny, would, you know, we both had that mentality of, you know, everybody should be into good music. Always, we always had that thing, you know. So until so we were doing these kind of house dub things and then then you had, you know, uh, hip hop and reggae that we were playing in the clubs. So we had decided to put out uh, our first single as Masses at Work with a house record on one side and a, and a hip hop reggae sound on the other side. And that's when we did the hot dance, which was a track Kenny had, you know, which I used to play at uh, Roseland, uh, you know, religiously like crazy. It was people were going mad. It was it was a big street record. We did not expect it to be like one of the top voguing right know, records people. anthems. It became anthemic with that crowd. Right. Yep. So, but we did arrange like a dub. We broke it down, and that's when we had that. You know, you hear the clap by itself and the whole thing, and. And um, we had no idea. It wasn't until Willie Ninja told me a couple of years later how big that record was in the um, in the uh, the voguing scene. May you rest in peace, Willie. So, um, okay, early '90s. I'm in Roseland, and 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 we're playing this record, and I'm playing in other clubs, and I'm playing all, the, all of our music. You know, um, somebody reaches out that I haven't heard from in like six or seven years. It was Don Welch. Mm. So you in the record pool, he was working in yeah. the record. I mean, I was working in the record pool and he was one of the DJs that give the records to. So Don Walsh used to play in R&B clubs. And um, he came up to me and he says, Louie, man, I really love what you're doing. You know, this masters that work sound, all the stuff that you, you know, putting out. You know, I'm doing this this night and, and I want to see if you wanted to play. And I said, what, what kind of stuff you want me to play? He goes, play, do whatever you want, whatever you want. I said, wow. And I thought to myself, man, this will be a new way of, of me breaking this sound that we have. You know, this will be wonderful. So uh, there was a club called Elite, uh, Savage and Elite, I believe. Oh, yeah, right. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Street, yeah. That's so right. Don Welch uh, brought me in to do a party and with him. I played the party. I didn't do the party. He promoted the party with Barbara Tucker. And I also remember Barbara Tucker because in 86, she was in a group called the Harlequin Four and they did the female version of Set It All. That's right. You know what I'm saying? So I'll never forget, I saw her name on the credits. And, um, you know, they had this party that they were uh, doing on, on a Wednesday and um, they wanted to do like an industry night. You know what I'm saying? Like invite a lot of people from the industry, whether you're a Broadway dancer or a DJ or a, you know, uh, a jazz musician or or uh, just a regular New York City, you know, street dancer. We want an actor or whatever. We want you to be here and enjoy yourself to these sounds of, you know, Louis or whatever. So um, we did the parties and they were wonderful, man. Those two or three parties that we did. And, um, you know, we would talk at the end of the night and stuff. And he's like, Louis, man, I want to take this somewhere and do like a regular thing. If I get a regular spot, would you think about being our resident our you know our dj every single week i say yeah sure man i think it'll be cool good because i took a break from the freestyle clubs for about a year and a half right at the end of 90 i stopped playing in the freestyle clubs you know and in, in, in that type of setting it was too much uh there was too much uh violence starting in the scene there was fights and stuff and i was well, just like mm -hmm. i was going to ask you about that because i remember i did the roseland thing some people left one night and somebody got, I was going to say stabbed, and it made the paper. Was that the night you played? That was a, that was a party. Uh, well, I don't want to name the promoters. That you have to name the promoter, just at the time. The party, but it was around that time. Yeah, it was around that time. But it made the know, news, bro. That was a big I thing. I don't think I played that party, but I did play for, you know, the, the promoters, you know. Um, and, you know, because... Um, the thing was, it was a lot of people coming from different boroughs, and you had it was like hip hop, it was like house, it was everything mixed mixtures. In. It was just a big mixture, and um, it was just becoming a little too much. And I said, you know what, I'm just gonna chill from this because I started traveling to Europe, to to England. I started traveling to England, so I right. said, you know, let me uh, focus on the international thing, and and then um, figure out what I'm gonna do later on, you know. Um, so I made the album, 
you know, with Kenny, uh, Mark Anthony, Envy and the whole crew at Atlantic Records. And, um, and then I started uh, going overseas a little bit. Um, but uh, Kenny and I just got focused into the studio and that was it. Once we did that Debbie Gibson thing, um, then it was Chris Cuevas, then it was San Etienne, then it was Chic Mystique, then it was like, oh my God, it just kept going and going and going. This is Stansfield, No yeah. Colors, it was like one record after another. What yeah, yeah. MAW mix, MAW remix, Louis Vega MAW, Kenny Dope MAW. It, it was it was mostly <laughs> MAW. It was Masses at Work because we really focused on those Masses at Work dubs and, and put them out. It wasn't uh, until a few years later, like you know, that we did some of the the um, some of the solo projects that we had. You know, um, I did Hard Drive and um, right. And he did the Bucketheads. You know what I'm saying? So and know, the hit, then New York and Soul rolls in. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was it was it was just like back to back man. I'm talking about 10 years of solid studio work, you know, 14, 16, 18 hours even a day. Super dedication. You know, um That was one thing everybody wanted always wanted to know. How the hell do you have the stamina? Travel, jump off a plane, gig, and then next thing we know, you're in a studio not too long after and going. How, what, what's the driving force for you? Yeah, driving force is passion, man. I love what I do. I love this. And, uh, you know, I love uh, making music. And um, for me, um, I guess all the years of doing it, got, you know, I, I developed a, a, uh, a system of, you know, how I'm able to do all that, you know. And, and, and that, it's like you're a door cell, bro. You're like, you just don't. It's like sometimes I look at you and I go, God oh, bless you. You just don't, you don't stop. Incredible. Well, you know, um, the thing is that a lot of people, they see a lot of music coming out, but that's music I made way before. You know what I mean? So a, a lot of the music that I put out, I may have made six months to eight or eight months ago, and it comes out now, you know. Um, but once you start getting in a flow of making a lot of music, you know, you have a lot of music that just sits there. And and for me, there's a time for everything. So um, I've just I, I developed a good sense of of uh, when it's time for that to come out. So let me explain to some people how important this is now. You got to realize something. The mid 1990s, okay, Sound Factory Bar on 21st Street Underground Network is a Wednesday night party with all industry people, and I'm talking from CNC Music Factory to every major record producer and house music coming in and out of town to come bring Mr. Louis Vega their music. So in the hopes that he would be able to start playing it because records were being literally signed as this man was playing them. And Gladys Pizarro, you heard her story strictly. We were joking about this. She would be hanging out. She'd be hearing records and signing from producers. And that's the kind of thing that happened. And, and a lot of things jumped off of this whole time period of hearing him play on a Wednesday night and then, you know, you had Sound Factory, Frankie Knuckles, had a lot of great DJs at the, around the same time. But Wednesday night, you had all the industry together. So there was this kinetic energy happening where people were meeting people, uh, artists were working with other producers, and then you were getting to hear your own records play before they even played on the mix shows. So, you know, how many records he helped make, that he helped sign? I can't even tell you. It's so many. It's so many, and, he, and, and and we've all thanked him. And he does it now. He'll go out and he'll start playing records he believes in. And that's the thing where he said how important the DJing is to what the production side is and the writing and the remixing, that you're making it and you're breaking it. And you're also helping others, too, along the way. He helped start a lot of people's careers. I mean, it's crazy. It's amazing the stuff that he touched. You well, know? That's, you know, when when we had, uh, as I said before, when uh, Don Welch did those few parties, he he said, I want to get a, a spot. Would you be the resident? I said, OK, well, he started scouting around and looking around New York City and he ran in you know, to the, the Sound Factory bar where uh, Frankie Knuckles had already been playing there for a year because the club opened up a year before. And I remember that club being uh, a, another club a long time ago called Private Eyes. Yes, I get That's correct. I, I well played at. You know, he's a friend of mine for many years. You know, um, I mean, we, we all used to hang out back in the days and played, you know, in, in, in the same era of, of music. So um, I remember that that location as a 21st Street. 
I said, man, this is perfect because my studio is on 23rd Street, two blocks away. Check How great that. is this? I checked that out. Walk, walk a block over and you're at the club. Yeah. Well, it wasn't my studio yet. It, 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 it became our studio, MAW Studios later on, but it was our manager's studio at the time. And uh, Dave Darlington, one of our engineers from back in the days, one of the greats, we love Dave Darlington. Great guy. Uh, who, who worked on so many of our, our records and did amazing uh, work on them. Um, you know, uh, we started doing... Um, we started doing the Sound Factory Bar, I think in 92, I believe it was, mm-hmm. until 97. It was like five years, five and a half years, something like that. And um, once we went to the Sound Factory a Bar, we started with 50 people. There was nobody there. You know, I was playing from the, it was, a, the booth was in the top, looking down. And, we, you know, we, we started with a very small crowd. It took a minute, you know, and uh, we kept just building and getting people in and, you know, keeping that industry thing going. And in a few months, forget about it. It was packed. It was, it was really, um, blew the roof, man. It was, it was cool. And you had everybody hanging out there. Everybody. You know, I'm everybody. telling you, everybody. <laughs> yeah, man. yeah. And I was, you know, I was in my glory because I had a, I had a, uh, an incredible sound system to play on, you know, uh, made by Steve Dash, who was another sound genius. Um, you know, so, um, that was one of his, uh, playgrounds, I guess, of, uh, of systems and and um and to hear Frankie Knuckles play on it, Frankie Knuckles, you know, amazing the way he made that system sound. You know, I learned, and I even talked to him about it. You know, about his settings and how he did it. And I was looking at him how he did it. He would come on a Wednesday too, and he would tweak it for me too. And I would remember those tweaks because remember I was just starting there. He was there a whole year. You he know, knew how to make that system work. He knew how to make it sound. He great. knew how to make it sound amazing. And so he would do that for me, which was, you know, a lot of DJs don't do stuff like that. You know, he was really kind enough to 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 uh, set it up for me so that I could learn from what he was showing me. You know, so even at that time, you know, when I had already been playing for a good, uh, what, professionally for, what, seven years? I was still young, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, but I think for me, um, with house music and, 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 and really uh, elevating in, in, in the sound and everything, I really felt like I found my identity and, and just the way I played music and what I was doing, you know, and, and how I made that night flow. Uh oh, did we lose him? Let's see. Maybe the Wi-Fi will come back. Everybody, Louis. Oh, I think we lost him. Yep, back. Are you at Lou? Yeah. Oh, hang on. Yeah, I'm mute. Okay, how's that? There you go. Okay, so how you were flowing and making music and young in your career and and how I was playing music, I really felt like I found myself finally. Like, I didn't feel all through the 80s that I really, I was in my most, most comfortable zone. Like, I was doing it, and I was feeling good, but, but even mixing on a, you know, the way I was mixing everything, it was, that was it, you know, I, I was there. And it, I felt the most natural, the most comfortable, and from there on, it was just, that's it. It's not. It's on. It's not a, it was never uh, an issue or a problem. I mean, it's it's a DJ thing. You you gotta understand. Um, you there? Yeah, I'm here. No, we're all here. Go ahead. It, it's a DJ thing. You gotta understand. It's 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 a uh, feeling really in that comfort zone. It took me that many years to 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 feel that way. Even though it probably felt like I was doing my thing and all through that time, but I feel that when I was at the Sound Factory Bar at the Underground Network parties, from there on, it's just, you know, the DJing thing was was uh, at its most comfortable level, you know? And um, man, I gotta say, you know, it was really um, magical, you know, to be working, uh, making those records with Kenny in the studio, and then we would come to the club on Wednesday night and test out that material you know, and, and, and see everybody's reaction, 
you know, it was special. And then, um, and of course, you know, yeah, of course, I opened my arms to everybody. I was like, yo, bring me the music. Let's go. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that was yeah. it. Yeah, I know that. You were open. It was, you know, DJs like you, Armand Ben Heldon, um, 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 Real to Real, uh, Eric, uh, Eric, Ralphie, um, yep. Todd Terry, um, the list goes on and on. Uh, you can name more. I mean, I'm like, DJ Sneak. Queen. <laughs> first came to the club. That was so nice uh, to, to, to meet him. And I loved his records already. I was playing a lot of them at that time. Um, oh, goodness. Uh, it just became like the playground of music. It, you know, you, you, would, you would come in and, and, and bring me a song on a, a reel to reel or an acetate. And I would play that, that track. And, uh, few weeks later it's like the biggest thing there you would see the crowd responding to it you know because there's always i've always had a crowd that was very real with you you know they would definitely you know uh respond to something right away they were like it was like playing to a lot of tastemakers right people who could recognize something on that first play be like yo this is this is a hot jam you know of course def mix morales uh knuckles you know, you, I even had one time, I'll never forget when um, David Cole, you know, came and surprised me and he brought his keyboard Oof. and he played live while I was DJing. And he was already huge with CNC Music Factory at that time, but he came and played live. And that was something I would never forget. Another night I'll never forget is when uh, when we first did um, New Eureka Soul and um, we finished You Can Do It. And George Benson, we invited him to the club to hear it. And he came and hung out in the club. He loved it. And he grabbed the mic and started singing, uh, you can do it and give me the night. It was, wow. It was, you know what I'm saying? It was, yeah, there was some, definitely some unforgettable moments. Momentous, and momentous nights there. The first night that I played Deep Inside, the first night that I played um, um, these sounds, uh, Kenny's uh, Bucketheads, a huge hit, you know, but when they were just in the beginning stages, you know what I'm saying? Like those records, uh, Michael Waffer, like uh, uh, all those records. Uh, and um, and don't forget at that time when I started at the Sound Factory Bar, you know, we had that Masters at Work album and um, we were making those dubs. So the first thing we wanted to do was, okay, we're making these dubs with these, you know, sample hooks and and let's try to do a song over these dubs this this dub vibe and that's when we did i can't get no sleep and uh and you know india wrote the song on um on the track and that was just so huge yeah it's like every time you turn around another big one another big hit here it was it was just kept going and and we just kept mixing away and and um and producing and at, at some points we had multiple rooms going. We had like two rooms in, uh, in MAW Studios. There was a smaller room. And I'll never forget, in one room, Kenny's working in the other room, and the other room I'm working, and I had a uh, move to swing, and, <laughs> and uh, Lem, John, and I are, are doing the, the lewd record, and then I invited um, um, Donna Rush to come in and, and, and sing the song, and I'm, uh, I'm putting up signs with names of DJs and he's just improvising and saying all the names of the DJs when you hear that part of the song and he's doing his thing, you know? And, um, uh, or I'm in the room with John Seaphone in the other room, Kenny's maybe working with a musician or something. And I'm, uh, uh, playing keyboards to, uh, I get lifted, you know, to the dub and John Seaphone is doing the beat to that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, uh, or Barbara Tucker singing the dub to stay together on, you know, right there, you know, it's just getting sassy and using her lower register, you know, so it was really dope uh, times that we had up in that studio, uh, in both those studios. Oh, yeah. You know, little Lewis, when I invited him down and and um, we uh, came up with the loose squared, uh, you know, uh, alias and um, and he just wrote that whole thing out right there on the spot and uh you know, I play the keys on the on, on that groove and everything, and we just developed this relationship. Then I, he invited me to his studio, and I, you know, um, um, I did that beat to uh, "Freedom," "Freedom," yeah. And um, he wrote that great song on Strictly Rhythm, and um, I played the bridge to the song. You know, so we was all like 
doing things with each other. It was so much fun, you know. Lem Springsteen, man, we had some great times in there. I had him in the in the vocal booth. He did Curious, man. He just threw down on that track, you know. It was, it was real cool, you know. And um, it was, you know, it was a lot of unity going on, you know. Right. A lot of unity, a lot of us coming together and 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 uh, just creating, you know. And then the end of the 90s come, and then the 2000s. Yeah, man. You know, we had the New Eureka Soul Out. That changed everything. That's, that's right. We made us all wear suits to go to the supper club for your big party. I'll never forget oh, that. Uh, you <laughs> you told us, oh, yes, you said you have to get dressed up. You made us all get dressed to yeah. come to that party. I'll never forget yeah. that. You messed up at the supper club. That's right. At the supper club. That was a big thing. Yep. Yep. Hang out with all the George Benson. Yeah. All of them. Anani and I, I remember, don't forget, because we had first gotten together when um, when, um, when the Eureka Soul was about to come out around that time, when I was doing You Can Do It, I believe. And um, when I was working on that with Kenny and George Benson, and, um, you know, we had this party to go to, and everybody was so excited with the outfits and everything. My mother came down. I mean, you know, I heard, I heard there was some artists up in there, I'm not going to mention, but there were some big artists checking this new thing out whatever it was new eureka soul so um it was really cool a cool thing that um mars bernstein from uh, giant step mm -hmm. and Charles peterson you know they were the ones who signed new eureka soul you know uh, Giles peterson were talking loud in the uk and europe and um giant step through uh blue thumb which is tommy the puma may he rest in peace in his label and um that's how we got to meet george benson because of tommy the puma you know, um, but yeah, but that night everybody came down. You had George Benson there, Tito Puente, Eddie Palmieri. I mean, you know, Jocelyn Brown, India, like it was Roy Ayers. Yeah. And they performed too. They performed. Yeah. They threw down. They did like, That's a, right. don't forget everybody. They performed yeah. for us. We were like, wow. Yeah. Wait. I think it was the first time all those artists were at any time were ever together in one place. You know what I'm saying? Like that, all, all those names, you know? It was it was really uh, impressive, uh, impressive, brother. Oh, and my yeah. DJs who 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 opened up for us, it was great. Who um, I mean, who played the night? Not opened up, they played the night. Was uh, Joe Clozel and Francois? That's right, Joe and Francois played. That's right. Thank you to them who played amazing. When we were coming in, we heard the vibe. It was just like, man, this is perfect. Wow. Yeah, you couldn't get any better than that, right? Yeah, you can't. Man, that was really really wonderful. Yeah. Wow it's 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 a book you have to write someday we hope you yeah will. man definitely gonna it's definitely uh books are in a uh, book is in the works and uh also uh a documentary you know documentary you know uh, i mean we have masters at work we have me and soul we have the louis vega story the kenny dope story the, yeah the there's Andy like six story. seven eight stories wrapped up in this yeah. book so now of course we know the whole new york in part the nineties, of course, you traveled the world and you, you know, Louis Vegas got his Vega family albums and congratulations on now the Grammy again. And you won a Grammy, uh, with the Curtis Mayfield. Where are you now? Well, thank you. Well, now, you know, we're dealing with this whole situation, you know, we're all, uh, staying creative, uh, surviving, you know, and um, keeping things positive. I mean, this this stream live show has been uh, beautiful. This I do it right here. You know where I'm at. I mean, systems right in front of me. Yes. Um, but um, you know, it's really been uh, therapeutic, and um, you know, this, you know, there's been a lot of uh, sad things and not so good things, but there's been wonderful things too that have happened. You know, uh, on a family level. You know, I'm. I'm it's something that really needed to happen. You know, that's all I want to say. And um, that's for you, Bob. Yeah, yeah. For me, um, you know, you're on the road all this time, but nothing beats the family, man. You know. Oh and, yeah. And I love everybody around the world. It's beautiful, you know the, you know the way everybody receives you, and you know, you remember you're giving a piece of yourself to everybody around the world, but you know, you have your family over here too. And there's been a lot of a lot of uh, traveling you know, for years and years and years and, and um, missed years that I really regret, but um, I'm really happy where we are now, at least, you know, wow, you know, we are um, just together, you know, but um, 
Yeah, so so this uh, the stream live thing has really uh, been wonderful. You know, I want to thank everybody out there who's been um, following me all these months. You know, I've been really dedicated since April 20th all the way till now. You're talking, you know, nine months and change. So, um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm really uh, proud of the shows and what we're doing and how it's growing. And, you know, it's really grassroots. It's not something that I wanted to blow up everywhere and have a million followers. If it, you know, the more it grows, the better it is. But, you know, uh, for me, I want it to, it to happen naturally. And and, and it is happen, not happening naturally. And there's a lot of wonderful people coming together. And I think that um, these shows have helped a little to uh, a lot of people out there. And Oh, hell yeah. Are you kidding? Come you know, on, done a little? No, but, you know. It's a I, lot. They've done a lot of things. I don't take anything for granted, you know. And I think that, um, you know, I want to thank everybody for, you know, uh, committing themselves to the times that I come on here, you know, um, I'm enjoying it as much as they are, you know, and I appreciate it. You know, that's all you can do. That's all you can do. And, you know, uh, I'll speak for myself and many of the DJs and other record producers. We can never thank you enough for helping what you do to the scene. You know, you're a big part of it. Um, and you know, you're an inspiration for a lot of us. You know, you were first in many different areas. You stepped out of the box to do things and you didn't care what anybody thought. You did what you thought was right. And you know what? Congratulations to you because that's what they say when you have a big pair of cojones to take that chance. And you did many times. You know, you do albums. You know, people joke. They say, damn, Louis got another album out. <laughs> another album. I was like, we just didn't, we just couldn't get freshly like involved in the last one. It's like we're already now into another album. It's they're like, what is up? This is what people think and then what I hear this from other people. So I'm making a joke with you about it. It's like, yo, Papa don't stop. He don't stop. It's like he slapped us with another album. It's like, and that's well, the, the thing is with those albums. I mean, because I put out, yes, I put out seven albums this year. And <laughs> see what I'm saying. No, but those albums uh, were albums I have put out in the past that the rights reverted back to me so they can fall back in my catalog. Gotcha. So what I did was I, I did extra, you know, a couple of unreleased tracks on each of them just for the people who already know about this record and may have had it already, but they have this new stuff here. And the people who don't know get this new experience, you know. So, um, you know, there's a whole world out there, man, the streaming world. The, the, oh, yeah. The, there's the vinyl world. And um, so now you know i'm able to put out all this music again and i said you know during this time i said to myself what am i going to do what, what can i start with what what you know when, when we were just locked in i'm going anywhere you know i haven't left my house in 10 months i said well what am i going to do i said well why don't i focus on these albums that i have and then reintroduce them to the world out there and that's exactly what i did and uh the last one now is the uh the christmas album you know, Vega Family uh, Christmas Collection, which uh, I, I started making an album, uh, I'm making a record every year, a Christmas song. First, I was starting to do remakes and I said, let me let me do some original works and reach out to my family here. And I reached out to Josh Milan and to Tony C, who are amazing songwriters. Oh yeah, Tony Colangio, she's great. Tony C, yeah. Both of them came in and they wrote um, great songs that are going to be here for years and years. So, um, now I decided to put it all together and put some unreleased versions I have from the Christmas uh, records too and and, um, and and release the full album. So now you can check it out. If you just want to hear it on Spotify, check it out. Big uh, family co uh, Christmas collection. Get it, people. One last, another one of these last questions. I mean, people have been writing. Is Masses at Work coming back together to work work? How's that going? Because you to can. Work, work. Work. What does that mean to work, work? Well, you know what I mean. Not work. You know what I mean. Like get back into the old, the old way of how you operated back in well, the day. What we what we've done is uh, we took down all our music from Track Source and Beatport uh, from MAW Records. Okay. We own. So those are records we own on MAW Records on our label. So we took them down. We went in and we rema uh, remastered. Uh, 55 versions, you know, uh, 55 different tracks from the, uh, I believe there's about uh, a little over 70 releases, um, maybe a little more than that. But um, we are going to re-release the entire catalog in a few months. 
you know, we're talking about the whole campaign now and everything and what we want to do to help uh, let people be aware about of this. Right. What we can do to promote it. So uh, we're meeting about that. So we're putting, we've, we've redone all our artwork, everything. So it looks really fresh and new and colorful. It's wonderful. It's really cool. Really cool. I'm really excited about it. Um, Kenny is as well. And um, we have three EPs that are brand new that we're going to release. And we'll probably be releasing one of them with the whole catalog being released. There's going to be gotcha. one, one new mess that work on it. And then um, I can't tell you the rest from there, but we're definitely. Right, that's a good start. I mean, look, he's got enough, a lot of catalog. We have a lot coming and we're excited about it. And, um, you know, um, and in a few months, uh, Kenny and I are going to get together, you know, because we live in different states now, by the way. I know that. He's in he Delaware. A whole other state. Like, yeah, he's in Delaware. He's far. If I want to see him, I, I got to drive like two and a half hours, you know. <laughs> We'll yeah. take a helicopter. I don't know. <laughs> no, I can't take a helicopter. But um, yeah, we, you know, you got to drive out there like two and a half hours, but which is a cool drive. Though. But I'm going to uh, go meet him soon. He's going to come here soon, so we're going to do some of that. And um, and we'll be seeing yeah. film. We'll be seeing fellow you guys, and and doing all the surprises. But I just can't say anything because oh, you don't have to know. I mean, people have just been wondering what's you know what's on. And aside from that, you're going to keep producing like crazy. We know that. Well, you know, no, I have a new album that I was finishing. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Another round. What's the new one? album that I, I was finishing uh, for Nervous Records because I did the NYC disco album. Yes, great my album. album. Yes. My album is more like, you know, uh, hitting on house music today. And, and you know, um, I collaborated with some great people. You know, uh, this album is going to come out probably in April because of this whole situation. Mm hmm on nervous records and um you know the collaborations are off the chain i mean you know uh robin is on there um moody man uh, honey dijon um bernard fowler uh, formerly of the peach boys uh lisa fisher uh unlimited touch brand new song um goodness there's so many uh what carrie chandler you know i i really reached out to oh wow you reached out to all the peeps well, that I haven't worked with as well. So, uh, and some I have, you know, they're part of the family, but uh, a lot I haven't worked with. And uh, I was really, uh, Joe Clozell, I was really excited to to uh, to uh, just get in the studio with them. And um, we came up with some great, some great music and I'm excited about it. So it'll be on Nervous uh, sometime in uh, hopefully April. April. All right. Yeah. Well, Louie, yeah. man, you captivated us. Yeah, for the big day, we'll see what happens. But uh, no matter what happens, uh, I gotta say with this uh, Grammy nomination, I'm really excited because, you know, um, a true record from our house community was nominated, you know? Yes. It, it wasn't like I, I, I did a remix on a pop artist. It was like, this is a, a record from the house scene. Homegrown from our scene, yes. Homegrown, grassroots. This is Jasper Street Company. This is Baltimore. This is, uh, you know, the basement gospel. boy. Ben, gospel house, Louis Vega on the remix duties, and it was nominated. So I'm really proud. And anybody, if uh, you're out in Times Square, look out for that LED. Pictures, yeah. Yeah, man, I'm excited Pictures. about it. I'm going to go check it out tonight. Uh, thank you, Michael Weiss, for... You know, uh, you know, believing in, in in all of us, you know what I'm saying, and 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 really taking it to the next level to do something beautiful like this. You know, I'm really happy about um, you know, the 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 steps that he takes to promote and uh, and and takes music to the next our music to the next level. You know what I'm saying? So uh, it's good to have a good team and oh yeah, you know, that's important, very important. Shout out to my baby Anane. I love you very much, man. It's you know we're we're making a new uh her, her disco EP. You know we're we're really excited because we got you know we're, we're gonna plan a string uh, session for the for the spring with uh, Patrick Adams and Leroy Burgess. Oh, uh, wow. the record. There's three more uh, tracks that she's doing, so I'm really excited about that. That's on Nervous Records as well. So you know we got we got some 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 cool so music. If you look in your crystal ball, looking forward. OK, and you know what we're living through right now, pandemic. Do you believe in your heart that clubbing the way we we know it will, will come back? 
you know, it's it's going to take a lot of time, you know, to get back to normal. Because even if everything opens up, you know, there's there's going to be restrictions and there's going to be rules you have to follow to to even go somewhere. You know, get, get ready for that. You know what I'm saying? It's not it's not going to be easy. But um, I think eventually it will. It's just going to take a lot more time than everybody thinks. You know, so right. We got to stay positive and, and keep doing what we're doing. Thank God that some of us, you know, and, you know, we're able to put out music and do what we do. But, you know, um, I mean, my heart goes out to all the, you know, all the people in the entertainment industry that, you know, um, are having a, a hard time. I'm having a hard time. Everybody's having a hard time. Ooh, no this is that you want to call decimation? This is decimation to everything. Anything, restaurant, club, anything that has people. Yes, yes. A decimation. That's terrible. Anything, I mean, well, you know, the yes. political issue, I don't even want to touch that, but that's a whole other thing. So hopefully with the changeover that's coming in and hopefully with the vaccination, I know some people don't want to take it. Some people are going to take it. Like you said, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time, yeah. It's going to take some time, but I don't, I don't think it's never going to come back. You know, um, I just think it's going to take time. Well, I think what people are realizing before this pandemic happened, you probably heard the same thing. They were saying, well, you guys can do this from your home. You won't have to travel and you'll, you'll see, watch what will happen. And what I'm starting to hear people say is, I want to go back out again. I want to hang out. You know, they were telling us, well, we're not going to be around long enough to keep you guys coming over and, you know, these big raves and big house parties. And I'm saying, now it's been taken away from you. Now, what are you going to do? You know, so we're at that point where people are starting to scratch their head going, I think I want to go out every night again. I like this idea, you know? Well, you know, I think that definitely, you know, when we get past all this, hopefully that there is, you know, everybody misses it already. Of course they do. You know what I'm saying? Of course they do. I mean, you know, you a social, uh, it's a big part of life, you know, being social. It's a, it's a huge part of life. You know, you have to connect with people. You know, we can't, I mean, look how we're, we're talking right now. Yeah, is it crazy? This is crazy. I'm talking through Zoom. I can't, I can't touch you, man. I no, and I would hug you. You'd be like, we have, we would hug each other and not think about, oh, he may have COVID. Nobody was ever thinking that before. It was like, dance music was always a loving thing. We all love what we all do. We all respect each other. So not yeah. to have that camaraderie to go hang out in a spot or we run into people, it's terrible. It's horrible. Well, listen, for now we have this and we have to make the best of it. And that's why I thank you for coming on because everybody, I, I'll tell you, out of darkness just came. I've created like you something. I said, okay, I'll do the DJing thing, sure. But I wanted to do something where people got to hear all of you speak from your heart and explain the road. And you really did, bro. You broke it down. Holy smoke, you broke it down. I can't thank you enough. Merry Christmas, Louis Vega, the Vega thank family, <laughs> the, the Nervous Records crew, the Grammy people. I mean, everybody, congratulations. Keep doing what you do. Don't stop on radio. Keep playing on WBLS on Friday nights. Keep doing everything right. you do. Don't forget, everybody, he plays on WBLS too. For 15, Ooh. 16, how many years now? 16 years? No, 10, 10. Oh, I thought, God. Okay, sorry. I gave, I'm putting on too much. 10 years on the radio with Kevin Hedge. They used to have Cielo on, on Wednesday nights, his, his residency in New York. That's another thing. That was one last thing I want to say. He's probably the only one I know who's had the longest residencies out of everybody in New York. Wow. Nobody's had that many years to uh, playing continuously. Always praying. He's been there time and year after year. I gave it to him. Well, there's been a few. Timmy, Timmy had a long run. Oh, no, like, Timmy too. Timmy, but I'm talking about you, you know, for what you did. Incredible. Incre yeah, yeah, Tim Timmy did have a long run with the shelter. Yeah, definitely. And you took over vinyl too. I don't want to forget that either. You played it vinyl too. In the late night. There, man. What a what a great time that was, because you know, you had me on Wednesdays, you had a. Uh, uh, Danny Tanavi on Friday, Timmy on Saturday, Body and Soul on Sunday. Man, it was Vasquez down the road, this one here, yeah. that one there. It was crazy. 
And I remember I'm going to say this to another thing. And in those days, that was the last of the big club rooms. So you had the rich and low, like which you categorize ministry of sound, sound systems almost everywhere. Yeah. In New York, in Jersey. It was great. Like 15 or 20 of those sound systems. Right. And people don't get They don't understand. I'm like, it was like that. There was 20 rooms with systems that, yes, and we would all say, well, it doesn't sound as great as this club. But you look back now, you go, what, the worst one of them all? Yeah, yeah. The worst one. I was going to say that. <laughs> the worst one that we would say now is like the better than every one that we play at, just because the way things are now. Different world. Noe, man, thank you again. Happy New Year, bro. Feliz Navidad to you and your family. And thank I you. can't thank you enough. And, and the fans, and bro, just keep doing You got my support. Don't worry about thank that. I, if I was a Grammy guy, I'd be like, Check the box. I called Teddy. You got it, baby. Teddy Douglas, all you, the family. Take care. Next week. Thank you. Next week, we have a special New Year's special. We'll, we will mention it. And Louis Vega, man. God bless you, bro. Peace, you. brother. Take care. Take care. Merry Take care. Christmas. Bye.